Thank you to David for the introduction to come and talk to you today about some of our work and I'll also speak to you a little bit about other work that's going on in the field that I thought you might be interested in hearing about. Um, so my laboratory at the, the RBC, we're mainly interested in um, different aspects of, of equine reproduction and we particularly focus on pregnancy, so you'll see a bit of a pregnancy bias um, throughout here. Just to, um, to put up front, I work with a, a great number of people. We work very collaboratively with a number of people um, at the college. Um, Christine Verheyen, an epidemiologist who's actually here today. Um, we also work closely with a geneticist over at Texas A&M. And um, my team works very closely in Newmarket, so we work with the two large practices in Newmarket and a number of stud farms. So we've worked with 29 different um, st thoroughbred stud farms for a lot of the data that I'll show you and share with you um, today. And of course, a lot of our work is, is funded some by the Thoroughbred Breeders Association, Alvarado Trust, and, um, and HBLB. So what am I going to cover? What I sort of thought, what are you guys interested in, in hearing about in the context of reproduction? So I sat down and thought, well, actually, this is sort of what we're all looking at, the, the racing thoroughbred that's going to be healthy and come across the line first in the sort of greatest adult health, okay? That's what we're all after. This is, this is my mare down in, in Australia, the one day she won. It doesn't always work like that. Um, so what's really going to get that mare or that, that cold into that position? Well, actually, there are a number of things that we're hearing about today, about athletic performance, but actually the journey starts well before that. It's actually as early as what we call the periconception period, so the, a period around pregnancy that you can have events occur that can actually program sort of adult outcomes in adult life. So what I'd like to, to take you through today is thinking about different aspects that you might be interested in. One is firstly, clearly, you need to get your breeding mare pregnant, so thinking about conception. The next stage is maintaining that pregnancy, but actually also thinking about possible events that could be programming that fetus during pregnancy for sort of adult outcomes. So we'll look at breeding efficiency. I'm going to take you through some management factors that we've identified that modulate the risk of pregnancy loss, so the do's and don'ts. I'm going to do a couple of slides on this programming idea during fetal life and then also finish up with some, some areas, technical areas that we're moving to um, in the future. So let's start with this first conception, um, with conception, because clearly this is the, the first step. And if you've got a, a mare out at stud and you send her off for breeding on a particular cycle, you'll be thinking, what's the chances that she's going to fall pregnant? And these are some rates from different studies done around the world. They're done at different times. So if you're Irish and sort of puffing your chest up there, um, they are excellent rates. But these, there's probably also a little bit of year-to-year -year variation here that we see between seasons. So, but I think sort of the rates you're looking at these days are sitting somewhere sort of between sort of 60 and 70%. And there are a number of factors that are going to affect this. So we know, for example, with increasing mare age, you can get decreased conception rates. So some of these variations we'll see across studies will be reflective of the mare populations and those management decisions to keep older mares versus to concentrate on the younger mares. So you have to be a little bit careful if you're writing these down and, and comparing them. I think we need to start to look at the granularity of this and think about your, your makeup of mares. But it gives you a really good sort of ballpark of where you might like to head. What about, so the next step, you, you establish the pregnancy in your mare and routinely in, in veterinary practice, these mares are checked between sort of 14 and 16 days as their first pregnancy scan. Um, and so when we look at pregnancy loss in, in a sort of clinical way like this, an experimental way and a clinical way, we, what we want to do is think about pregnancies that are established at day 15 and whether they're lost after that. Clearly there will be also pregnancies that are conceived but they're going to be lost before 15 days but we can't easily detect those, so we don't have records. It's only through research that we know, actually. There are quite high rates there, and those conception rates I just showed you, probably about half of them that, that come out as not conceiving probably lost a, a pregnancy before the 15-day scan. So here are some figures here. So this is, um, if you look along, the gestation length of around 340 days in the mare. You can see here, we've I've divided this up into two periods. So you've got the embryonic period here, um, so um, up to around 42 days, and then we've got what I've called the, the fetal period. And um, these are some figures of pregnancy loss that were generated by Twink Allen's group back <laughs> on the 2002 season, and this is some data we've generated 
um, in 2013 and 2014 breeding seasons. And what you can see across both studies actually is that the highest um, rates of pregnancy loss are in this early phase. And this is consistent what we see in other species as well. Um, what we didn't really see, if you look at these sort of confidence intervals and, and take into account seasonal variation, what's interesting is we haven't seen much shift actually in this early pregnancy loss rates over um, this period of about 12 years. So we seem to have flatlined somewhat. And this could be explained potentially by the, the factors or the causes of early pregnancy loss, which I'll move on to in a moment, which could be things like genetics, for example, that we're, we're not necessarily going to be able to change. The other difference you can see here, if you, if you look at this, this combined number, we also looked at pregnancy losses between the 42-day stan and October. So you might start to see on your, your bills or in your management systems, if you're working with mares daily, that there's more commonly a 65-day scan. And that started to be done because that's when a lot of the fetal sexing is done. But what's been interesting is that actually I think from a physiological perspective that's really, really important too. So although in the horse we have this embryonic period here, and you can see here this is a section through a, a little developing fetus, this is at 46 days. So by 46 days all the organs are complete. It's quite remarkable actually at the very early stage of pregnancy. Essentially you've got this tiny, tiny little foal which is just going to get bigger and bigger for the other sort of months that pursue after that. Um, but what is different in the horse to all the other species is it has a really late implantation. So the placenta that supports that pregnancy actually doesn't really implant to sort of between sort of 38 and 60 days. So this period immediately after 42 days I think is absolutely critical to understand because they're major physiological events. So if they go wrong, that's actually another period you're likely to lose your pregnancy. So we do a lot of work in the lab now where we talk about early pregnancy loss rather than early embryonic losses because we want to be able to encompass this period. And interestingly, if you look at all the pregnancy losses that occur between 42 and the October scan, when the mares are next checked, you can see half of them are actually occurring these first couple of weeks. So driving home, it's important to, to have that 65-day scan. You can pick them up. And if you're lucky, you might even be able to rebreed these mares if you don't have endometrial cups and hormones that are going to interfere with that. If you look at the latter phases of pregnancy, you can see a reasonably consistent rate of pregnancy loss. So this is around sort of four and a half percent of pregnancies will be lost in this latter period. <clears throat> what about pregnancy loss across different regions? Um, well, you can see here, so this is, um, if we look in, in the UK here, we had the 6.4, but you can see this is not dissimilar, it's a bit, a bit higher, but dissimilar to New Zealand. The rates, this is quite an old study from the US, the last one done in thoroughbreds, and their rates of early embryonic loss were a little bit higher. Um, <coughs> and the main difference I think here regionally you can see is that the, the rates of pregnancy loss in the later period in the US were, were significantly higher than what some of these other regions will show, particularly New Zealand. You can see this is, these are very low rates. We don't really understand why this variation exists, but it, it could be in part due to, to management practices, particularly a lot of the mares out in the southern hemisphere are kept out in fields. Um, we find here, if you look at the, the Irish and, and the, the British horses, that they have very similar rates of pregnancy loss, and, and these, as I said, haven't really changed substantially over time. So if we're thinking about these pregnancy losses, I've given you this sort of incidence of, of how often these are occurring, but why do they occur? Why are your mares losing these pregnancies? Well, we think about a number of, broadly speaking, three sort of groups of factors that could explain why these mares have lost the pregnancy. Um, the first could be something related to the mare itself. So clearly the utero environment <coughs> is really critical to supporting that developing fetus. And the other thing inherent to the mare is the, the quality of the oocyte that she's, that she's just ovulated and is contributing um, to the developing embryo. Um, if we think on the embryo side, there's the genetics of the embryo. And this genetics will be both what's inherited, but also during early development as well, we can have induced changes in the genetics of these early embryos as well. And then what I'll talk a little bit about later and, and what we know from animal species and human work, we also get what we call epigenetics. So on top of this, we're getting a lot of changes in the early developing um, embryo. And clearly the placenta that's de developing is derived from these genes um, of the mare and the stallion. So this is going to feed into outcomes too. And then sitting in um, below this is what I call environmental or external. So these are things like um, temperature, management practices, 
exposure to pathogens. Um, I'm sure people here be sort of aware of things like equine herpes virus that can have quite devastating effects on stud farms. Um, the nutrition and also a number of these mares, both during what we call that periconceptual, so just before conceiving, just after, <coughs> and often during pregnancy, may receive various therapeutics along the way. So all of these things are going to feed in. But when we get down to the nitty gritty of the specific cause, so when I say a cause, that's when you've got a veterinary surgeon or if you're a, if you're a doctor, you're diagnosing why this specific, specific pregnancy failed. And it's actually very unrewarding. And so you'll probably, if you, you get feedback from your stud farm, it's about 80% of these we actually, if we look at pregnancies that fail before 65 days, about 80% of them we have no idea why. We haven't been able to attribute a specific cause. We know all these things together will do it. So, and we have about 10% that we know are non-infectious, so they've had some sort of developmental problem in their embryos that were in the placenta and about 10% are of an infectious origin in this early stage. And this is in contrast, if we look in mid to late pregnancy, this is a study done out of, out of France with a, a very large population of mares over a number of years. And you can see here they found that um, a majority of these in this population were infectious in origin, with about a quarter that are non-infectious and only a quarter where they didn't know. And we're actually in the process of repeating this in our um, thoroughbreds in the UK to try and understand late pregnancy. But the preliminary data that comes out and when you talk to the pathologist, the most common thing in the UK actually is umbilical cord torsions. We get torsion on the, the umbilicus and then out of the cord and then that will stop the blood supply to the fetus and those mares will, will abort. <clears throat> so you can see here, one thing we've honed in on and you can see is what I call this, in this case a grey box, but the big black box. Like what is going on? This is the area we can start to hopefully try and move the, um, the line. And so we first started about, about nearly 10 years ago um, on this study. We started saying, well, why aren't we making progress in this area? Why aren't you getting feedback on why your mares have lost pregnancy? And one of the biggest stumbling blocks we, we heard about was actually there's no material to study. So they're either lost in the paddock. We don't know what happens. We don't have enough information. So the next thing we went about doing was to develop a method to be able to get out these pregnancies like you might do in other species, flush them out. You can do that very non-invasively, just putting a, a, a tube through the cervix, popping some fluid in, and then by gravity, these um, conceptuses can flow back out in very early pregnancy. So they're quite small, remember, at, at this stage. So we found that we could, the clinicians would flush these out. This had the added benefit too, because those mares could return to cycle quicker as well. The uteruses were cleaned out. And then these had been transported down to the lab. And so we received um, a number of failed pregnancies. This gives you an idea when a pregnancy has failed, what sort of thing is presented um, to us. And then we did a number of things with these to start investigating them. One was to develop a method to try and culture cells from these pregnancies, to try and understand the genetics of them. And that could be used for also other future diagnostic tests. The other thing you can do is take up some of this tissue and isolate um, DNA from it, to, again, for genetic studies. That takes out that need for the step of culturing the cells and practically from a diagnostic point of view, it's a bit simpler. And then we've also been collecting these embryos and fixing them to look at developmental abnormalities because sometimes we might use a throwaway line of, oh, you know, the genetics wasn't right or, she, you know, this embryo had a problem, but we don't really know, actually. So we, we need to look to find out what they, they could be. So we do sagittal sections through these, looking, looking for those. <coughs> so really the main area that I guess we really wanted to focus in on, though, was investigating the genetics as a possible cause. So I'll show you a slide in a few minutes, but very similar to women. I actually think horses are not dissimilar to the, the current management of re reproduction in women at the moment, because you've got a lot of older mares coming through. You're trying to breed your mares well into your teens. And what happens is you get very high rates of pregnancy loss as you, you, as you go up. And I'll show you those rates in a minute. But you get about a fourfold increase in pregnancy loss rates if you look at older mares compared to younger mares. So that led us to hypothesize, well, maybe there's a, a genetic underpinning of why these pregnancies are lost. Um, so we've been able to overcome the barrier. So this technique I just showed you turned out to be very successful. We've been able to, um, over a couple of years now, I, harvest about 55 of these pregnancies, which give us a good enough amount of material to start to sort of answer these questions. And we found we could also isolate cells from these um, and grow them in the laboratory. This is a picture of them here. These are called trophoblast cells, so these are the cells of the placenta. And we were able to culture these in 62% of the samples that we received. 
So reasonably um, successful. This was using human um, protocols for culturing human trophoblast cells. And what we're interested in particularly is that, as many of you will know, humans have very high aneuploidy rates as women age. So a lot of those pregnancies that are lost in older women are due to what we call aneuploidy. So an extra copy of the whole chromosome, or in some cases, a loss of a whole chromosome. And their rates, even if you look at women sort of in their late 30s, you're looking at rates closer to 90% of, of these embryos um, when they look in IVF clinics. So they can be very, very high. So we hypothesise due to this age-related effect in the mare, maybe there's some sort of aneuploidy explaining why these mares are losing their pregnancies. But we've so far, you can see here, this is a, an image showing an example of a, a carrier typing. And we've also used something called an array, a chip array. So it's called comparative genomic hybridization. Essentially, you take DNA from the, from the placentas or the embryos and you put it onto a chip. And you can look at 440,000 regions of, of chromosomes across the whole, whole genome. And using those two different techniques, when we've looked at the initial 14, we haven't been able to find any aneuploidies. So in one way, we're a bit disappointed because we thought this would be a nice, clear answer. But actually, it's been quite interesting because we've found some other, with other things. What we did find is we, we found something called copy number variation. So if you've got an aneuploidies where the whole chromosome is either duplicated or lost, so what you can do is you can get a little part of that chromosome that's there's an extra copy or a loss of that copy. And we found a variation in these pregnancies that failed in these copy numbers of certain regions of the chromosome. And that's what we're um, investigating at the moment. Um, the other area that we were interested in and we're just starting work on now is thinking about the genetic role related to compatibility. So you may have heard people that send a mare off to, to one stallion and they'll try and breed with that stallion who was known to be a fertile stallion a couple of times and then they will not um, conceive and then they'll switch stallions and they will. So we're interested in the compatibility between two individuals and understanding those genetics and how they might relate to um, conception and subsequently pregnancies that are lost, particularly in the early period. That could be a, a genetic reason or it could be sort of some sort of immunological response due to um, incompatibility at the um, immune markers in pregnancy between a male and female. So this is sort of the area we're, we're going into at the moment. This is just to give you an idea of the sorts of things um, that we're interested um, in doing. This is um, what I was just explaining, a copy number variation. So you've got an area here that's duplicated. So here's, a normal, here's the chromosome here. And then you'll get this one area here that's duplicated, or you can get it to be lost. Now you can imagine, this is something actually that's normal in the genome. So we all have copy number variation in our genomes. Um, but if this occurs in a particular fe developing fetus and it contains a gene which produces a protein really important for development and you're changing how much of that, the dose of that, you can imagine that can have an effect, knock-on effect to development and could potentially um, interfere with that. And the advantage of using these um, microarrays is you can take DNA, um, mix it with a control and, and hybridize, we call hybridize it onto this chip. So then very quickly we can detect things like aneuploidies and be able to get an answer out um, reasonably quickly. So the genetics, as I said, is ongoing, but another way to, to, to look at this is from an epidemiological approach. So if you've got this black box, another way is saying, okay, let's take an epidemiological approach, think about what factors might increase or decrease a risk. And they're quite helpful because they're management factors. So um, this is work that we work very closely with, with Christine, who's here, um, looking at... Um, a large population of mares. We've looked at 2,246 pregnancies, and these were over 2013, 2014 season. And in the end, we looked at 23 different factors that we thought could potentially affect the outcome of these pregnancies. Some of them were risks that we thought were well-founded in a, a hypothesis that they could have an effect. Some of them are actually just routine things used in management where we wanted to feedback, actually, you don't need to worry. This is, might be used in routine management. It doesn't seem to have an impa impact. Um, and thinking about your mere embryo and external factors, I've just broken them down here. But the main um, change, um, the main effect actually on the mare level is mare age. So the, the odds ratio related to mare age was 1.1, but that's per mare year. So you can imagine if you're going between a four-year-old and a sort of 18-year-old mare, th those odds will be amplified significantly. 
Um, endometrial cysts was associated with an increased risk of pregnancy loss in this early period with an odds of 1.7. And if the mare, as soon as she's had one foal, so she had one live foal, and actually the risk went down at two, so we're still <coughs> trying to get our heads around this, but the, the take home message for you is as soon as she's had one live foal, she has an increased risk of pregnancy loss. Um, other studies have also shown, but we, we didn't specifically look at this in ours, that foal heat cover can increase the risk of pregnancy loss. Interestingly, very few, certainly in the new market population, are covered on foal heat. There was only eight out of 2,246 pregnancies. They're really low numbers. Um, the other thing, a work um, of a group in, in Japan have shown that body condition score between 15 and 35 days is really, really critical. So increasing during that period is associated with a, or decreasing during that period with an increased risk. And, and conversely, if you have an increase in during that period, you can reduce your risk. On the embryo so side, the, the size of the embryo is really important. So I'll come back to this in a moment. But essentially, for every centimetre increase in, in the size of that embryo, you have a, a reduced odds of four for that particular pregnancy being lost. And the ex from on the external factor side, there are lots of things actually that are routinely used in practice that don't have any impact, it appears, on these pregnancies but drugs that we used to induce ovulation did. So these are things what we call ovuplant, you might have, or corolon, you'll see. These are drugs that you give around the t time of cover um, to induce the ovulation. And actually, we found these had a beneficial effect. So we found that it reduced the chances of that pregnancy being lost. So these, these appear to be beneficial. I, thought, I said I'd show you the age effect because I think this is quite dramatic. So this is mare age here in years. So starting um, at two, running up to 24 years. Clearly there's more mares in these groups that sit around the middle here. You can see here um, between sort of four and, and 12. But interestingly, this is pregnancy loss up to 65 days. They're very low in the two to four year olds. It's like a stepwise up, step up here between five and 10. Again, between 11 and 19. So you can see it's actually as early as 11 years you start to see these effects of um, increased rates of pregnancy loss and, and much higher in our much older mares. All these numbers are very, very small. What about sort of the drugs that are used in your mares sort of over the last sort of 15 years or so? Well, these have changed a lot. So we, you can see here, these are different drugs that we use in general reproductive practice. So you've got estrus in induction. So these are things like prostaglandins that are used to short cycle a mare. You might have a stud farm that uses um, Regumate um, for a period of time and withdraws that to try and get that mare cycling, um, particularly in transition mares to try and bring them forward. So these are all things that are used. And we found that whilst there was an initial jump between 1998 and 2002 in the use of these to around 40%, this has remained quite stable over the, the time since then. If you're looking at the drugs that are being used at, um, to induce ovulation that I just mentioned, these have jumped up dramatically. So nearly all mares now um, are receiving drugs to induce ovulation. And you might ask why that is. I think it's primarily been driven to reduce cross covers. Um, so they have successfully reduced the number of cross covers. The average number of covers per cycle these mares has is about 1.1. Um, the other thing that we've seen a movement in is in covering treatment. So this is trying to optimise the environment for the, for the embryo in the uterus. And you can see back in 98, there was only 12% of mares receiving these, and that's jumped up now to 63%. And this includes 50% of mares receiving intrauterine antibiotics, 50% oxytocin, and 24% are getting the uterine lavage. So these are all efforts to try and sort of provide that, that best environment for the developing fetus. I will note, though, we, we were quite surprised about the high levels of the interuterine antibiotics. So I think this, from a um, regulatory perspective, with the you know, judicious use of antibiotics, we're going to have to find better ways to work out which mares need these antibiotics and try and reduce this antibiotic use. And I think the uterine lavage is a really good alternative for the mares that um, don't have good clinical reason um, for its use. So that's sort of all the figures and, and the risks. So the last couple of minutes that I've got now, I really wanted to just introduce you. Um, many of you will know this concept, but I did want to sort of mention it in the context of, of the horse. And this is something called Developmental Origins of Health and Disease, or DOHAD. And you will have read about this probably in, in the popular press. If you're a medic, you'll know well about this because of all the work done in, in human medicine. 
But the idea behind this is that events during early development can impact on adult outcomes. And this is just a, um, a summary here from a, a review article. I was particularly interested in this because Pascal Chavat Palmer, she has a group in France and presented at a session I was in at our British Equine Veterinary Congress um, last month. And I, she's really starting to take this area forward in the horse. But this is from one of her reviews, particularly looking at things that can, nutritional sort of impacts that can affect adult outcomes. And you'll probably be familiar with these, these are all animal models, but things such as the placenta not working adequately, the mother not receiving enough nutrition. Also interestingly, and probably relevant to, to this industry more, is potential overnutrition of these animals, so, and um, maternal obesity, and also maternal diabetes. And they've, they've found over a number of studies that all of these can have impact on adult, outcomes at adulthood. And these outcomes um, relate to things related that we'd be interested in in the thoroughbred. So bone development, muscle mass, um, fertility, cardiovascular disease, and, and generally metabolism. So I think these are sort of worthy to think about in the context of, of our thoroughbred. So what do we know about um, dohad in, in breeding mares? Well, we're in very early stages in the horse um, in this area compared to some studies. I know mean, there's a, a great study going on in the Netherlands at the moment in human, a PREDICT study where they have 10,000 women in, a, in a, a study looking at outcomes. But in the, the mare, we've sort of got some early evidence coming in. So a number of studies were done. These were done a little bit over the last sort of 15 years where people have increased or restricted fetal growth by transferring an embryo into a larger or smaller breed. So essentially take an embryo out of a pony putting it into a thoroughbred so it has this big luxurious sort of uterus to grow up in as, as a fetus. The other way of doing it is taking one from a thoroughbred and putting it back into a pony, so restricting its growth. So you're artificially giving it a little bit like interuterine growth restriction. You can do this in, thorough, in, in horses with that size difference because the uterus actually helps that fetus to adapt its size. So you can ethically and, and have these animals um, born without too many complications. In some other species you wouldn't have that sort of uterine adaption. But this is a, a very extreme but a nice way to start to sort of understand what is the effect of a luxurious uterus versus one that might not be as supportive. Other studies too that have fed into thinking about this idea of programming have been modifying nutrition, so such as concentrates, supplements such as selenium and, and copper, and looking at outcomes. Most of the outcomes, um, with the exception of one study which looked at um, older horses and musculoskeletal development, in particular a, a bone condition, a, a condition called osteochondritis dissecans, which was looked at in the older animals, but most of these studies are one day to 24 months that have looked at outcomes. So they haven't really looked into adulthood to a great degree, and I think that's probably cost-related. And what they've found is that, yes, these sorts of interventions or changes can modify bone development and lead to developmental changes in the incidence of developmental conditions. They can modify growth, cardiovascular health, um, and also modify in, um, energy homeostasis, so things like its ability to regulate insulin and, and glucose are modified in these animals with these different, different diets. So I think this begs the question, we have a lot of work to do in this area, but I think it's really important to think about your adult horse and where it is at, thinking about actually what was programmed back in, in fetal life and, and what can we do during the fetal period to optimise um, optimize that. The area that we're moving into in this at the moment is trying to think a little bit more about early conceptus growth. And what we found in a recent study is that these are measurements of the size of the conceptus between 10 days and 35 days for 1,800 pregnancies, roughly. And you, we looked at these in the blue dots in, in mares that went on to maintain those pregnancies in the early period and ones that lost. And you can see here, this had been shown before, but you can see here that the ones that are lost are actually smaller compared to the ones that are maintained. But the other thing, and we've gone on to look at sort of factors that regulate this difference in size and, and things that help these bigger ones, we found that um, changed the risk of the size was things like um, uterine lavage, that was beneficial, so that's another reason to use that over the antibiotics. Um, and things like ovulatory agents, which we saw reduce the risk of a pregnancy being lost, interestingly, increased the size here as well. So that fitted quite nicely together. The next thing we, what we were struck by here is huge variability, even in the blue dots here. Can you see that there's quite a lot of variability in the size of these embryos <coughs> during this early phase? So 
What we're interested in now is thinking about the long-term effects that may arise from small conceptuses. The PREDICT study done on human studies have actually looked at early embryonic development and they've been able to link changes in that early period to even cardiovascular health in childhood. So we're interested to ask the question, um, are these smaller conceptuses associated with any outcomes such as neonatal outcomes or bone growth or cardiovascular disease, for example? So just to finish up, um, a couple of take-home messages on the reproduction side is that we do start to see now a, a flat lining in the incidence of pregnancy loss um, over the last 12 years. I, we're working with um, software developers at the moment because I think there's a real need to have better systems to be able to monitor the reproductive efficiency, <coughs> analyse this performance both on a, an individual herd and a, and, a, um, and a wider national sort of basis. Um, we also find that there are a few diagnoses made on the cause of the pregnancy loss in mares, but we're now starting to develop new methods to try and address this. Um, we're interested in developing new genetic tests to be able to understand the genetic cause of these losses and be able to inform, inform matings. And I just wanted to, again, highlight this dohide idea, and I just think it's really interesting to think that there is evidence that it can impact on a number of body systems related to relevant to, to horses that are racing, so it's worth considering this. So, no questions. <laughs> <laughs>